I'm calling to order the, oops, I have the wrong one second. Let's see what's up here. Ah, I pulled up the fifth. Okay. I'm calling to order the June 4th special meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 4.04 p.m. With the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, and this is a special meeting. Did you hit record, Jennifer? You did, okay, uh, great. And so this is a special meeting and we will not have a public comment period for this meeting. Um, we do have Mattia in the audience who will be um, spending this time here with us. And I am going to leave her there so that she can have some freedom to, you know, do whatever she needs to do. However, Mattia, um, if you have any questions or would like to be brought in, just raise your hand and, and we'll bring you in. Um, so Dr. Shabazz is not yet here and I don't want to have to do too much repeating. So let me give him a quick call. I'm just going to recess us for two seconds to call him um, and we'll see if he plans to be here soon. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, let's Go ahead and get started, and then hopefully he will be here soon. I do not expect that Alexis will join us today. Um, so essentially, uh, Miss, actually, let's do a sound check. Dr. Rhodes, can you hear us, and can, can you be heard? I can hear you. I Great. Can hear. All right. Uh, and Yvonne? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Excellent. And oh, here we have a Shabazz. Good. <laughs> uh, hi, Dr. Shabazz. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, and Ms. Bridges, I see we have two of you now, so maybe you're able to get your camera going on one of these. I unmuted it and, and I can hear you and I took the, the stop video, So, but now I can't see it. <laughs> now oh it's goodness. just a black screen. Uh huh. Um, so I'll try this again. I'm just going to really go off on both. Okay. And, and see if that'll work. Okay. That okay. sounds good. <laughs> and Hala, how about you? Can you hear us and be heard? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Okay, so we, um, as far as I can tell for our time together today, there are two uh, main objectives. The first is for us to answer some of these questions um, from our charge related to eligibility criteria, use of funds, um, and things along that line, and we'll get a little deeper into that. The other piece that I'm hoping we'll be able to um, bring here into the into the presence of our meeting is how we would like the voice and tone of our report to to be. And so um, what I thought we could do is not necessarily um, to have a, a separate conversation about that, at least initially, but if as we're having discussion, if there's a particular voice or tone that a member feels they would like to make sure is integrated into the report, just to simply call that out so that Mattia, who is with us and is listening, can be taking note of that. Um, so just thinking about, um, you know, what is our attitude toward this subject and how do we want that to come through in our report? Um, and also what voice do we want to establish in the report? Um, I think it's, if you've read the article that I sent you all um, that was recently published about our work, I think it's clear that 
Um, we are the second municipality, I think, really, that is um, uh, taking this on in the way that we that we have and that we'll be publishing a report of recommendations. Um, and so folks both in the state of Massachusetts and I think beyond, um, even outside of Amherst, we have the state and then, of course, um, folks outside of Massachusetts are, are, are watching what we're doing. And so it's important that we are really clear about what voice and what tone we want to um, have integrated into the report and projected out into the world. Um, so I am going to um, just quickly review the three main items that we have to discuss. And what I thought we might do is... Um, if it's clear that we are coming to consensus on a particular item, um, then we there is no reason that the body has to vote on something uh, by motion. Um, if a motion is needed, then what we'll do is either if there's time, we'll pause and have a recess and I will attempt to draft a motion that of course can be amended. Um, or an, a, any member of the committee is able to make a motion. Um, so uh, let's say Hala had something that she felt strongly about and she wanted to advocate for and had the sense that maybe um, she didn't know if the, if the rest of the group was um, on board with that. Hala could make a motion and bring it to a vote to determine whether um, the, the body is, was going to adopt that particular um, piece of things. So uh, I think in sort of the, I, I don't want to say best case scenario, but maybe the smoothest would happen where we would come through discussion to consensus, and then we wouldn't necessarily have to bring something to a vote, but that doesn't mean that bringing something to a vote by motion is uh, wrong. We should absolutely do that if we need to do that. Um, so we'll kind of be checking in as we move through these discussions. Um, and Ms. Bridges, I just, I don't know if you heard me saying that uh, in addition to having these discussions on these particular topics that come from our charge, we're also going to be taking stock in terms of the tone and the voice that we want to be integrated into the report and to be projected out um, to the folks who will be reading the report. So if at any point there's a, a particular tone or voice that you want to ensure is represented, just um, you can just raise your hand and Mattia is going to be taking notes um, of that as well. Okay. I went in like in and out two, three times, I can see you, but it won't let me take start video. It won't let me put the, put me up there, but rest assured I'm right here and I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. So um, the three items that we have uh, specifically to talk about today are uh, one being the ongoing funding stream um, and discussions of uh, the, the current funding stream, as well as any additional funding um, recommendations that we may want to make. And then the allocation plan, which includes the eligibility criteria, um, may include use of funds and, uh, and, and all of that. And then the third is additional means of repair, truth, and reconciliation. Um, I, if the assembly is okay with this, I would like to start with the second of those three, which is the allocation plan and eligibility criteria. I think it's the meat. Um, of our work. It's probably going to take the longest for us to discuss. And I want to make sure that we have the chance to do that today. And uh, I'm less worried about the other two items. Um, I want Mattia to be able to start drafting, um, you know, parts of the report that relate to that. Is anybody, um, does anybody object to that? Okay. Great. So uh, I'm going to just quickly pull up the charge again um, so that we can uh, just review that. And then I'm going to hand it over actually to Dr. Shabazz um, to kick us off on that discussion. Um, let me just see here. Where am I? All right. So I'm going to share my screen.
Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. All right. Yes. Great. All right. So um, it's number two, an allocation plan, including eligibility criteria, which will be determined and approved by the broader Amherst Black community through a census and community feedback process. So we're here to represent um, not only our own views on this, but the views that we have heard come through the residents um, in the various listening sessions, as well as through the survey. Um, so with that, I am going to pass it over to Dr. Shabazz to give us a framework to get this discussion started, and um, and then we will open the floor up. So I was a little delayed in getting started because um, I was trying to get my laptop going, but I'm having a, um, <clears throat> but anyway, I'm on this iPad and I'm not able to share screen um, or have the documents in which to try and share screen, but let me just uh, offer a few uh, offer comments and then see where it might go with respect to discussion. Um, when I, uh, th this part of the charge, the question of an allocation plan, I would like to suggest that on the basis of the deliberations we had early on about funding streams, on the basis of the array of listening sessions and community survey and input that we've received that we could think of this allocation plan um, along two lines. First, we may reach consensus before um, our time is up on a specific project plan or proposal of support that we want to recommend. And I think that is, um, that is completely uh, uh, in order. And we should, we should look specifically at bringing forth motions around specific uh, proposals whereby we would recommend that funding, uh, whether from the reparations fund that has been building or rather from other sources, uh, that we may want to put forward. Um, and uh, certainly we have, uh, through our many listening sessions, there have been certain specific ideas, um, but, uh, uh, but I leave that for uh, others to, to make motions and I may make a motion um, uh, before, it's, before our time is up around specific ideas. When I look at Evanston, if you look at the first um, actual <clears throat> proposal that gained traction, that was approved uh, by the, the committee recommending to the city council and by the city council and the mayor, it was around a housing plan. It was around trying to address particular structures of injustice that have affected black Americans in the city of Evanston. And therefore the eligibility criterion was very specific to that specific injustice of housing, of home ownership, of the processes of redlining that had a negatively affected on the basis of racism had negatively affected black Americans in Evanston. And so the eligibility criterion was very specific to that particular um, structure of injustice that uh, the, 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 the city sought to repair. Um, so again, if in our allocation plan, there is a specific proposal to address a specific structure of injustice, then it would be incumbent on the proposal coming through this body that we may put in our, in our plan to then identify what might be the specific criterion. So again, if you look at the Evanston example, it was around people, Black Americans, people of African descent who lived in Evanston in a particular period of the 20th century when the racist process of redlining was going on 
And that is who were then eligible to apply a list. Many people applied, a list was created and out of it uh, on, on, on the basis of some process, an initial group of people were uh, 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 designated to receive awards in that process. So again, our plan may encompass specific proposals along that line, and we ought to be open to that and, and see, but we may, we may not. And so here then comes the more broad question that people have raised for us to somehow enunciate an eligibility criteria on the basis of our work and our work over these past uh, year, one year plus. And to me, it almost seems as though it is, um, that is for more educational value than really practically what will what we're, what we're recommending the council uh, to do in, in the future as from our plan, if you follow what I mean. If it's not about a specific structure of injustice and a specific recommendation we're making, then we're just enunciating a broad policy. And I'm fine for our plan to enunciate a broad policy. And I've suggested three criteria along three areas of, 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 of that we, we should look at along those lines. Those three standards included a residential standard, a lineage standard, and, and a racial identity standard, okay? And, um, and so if we look at those three, it's just a broad way of thinking. We're recommending here a broad way of thinking about the scope of, of reparative justice or work or the scope of our work to address particular structures of injustice, but other criteria may come into play depending on the specific issue someone is proposing to deal with. Um, uh, or not to say, or even to say if an individual uh, uh, steps forward and says, here, help me with this. Um, so, the first then would has to do with the criterion of being a resident in the town of Amherst. Okay, we know we have many people who might have been born in Amherst who now live elsewhere and do not vote in Amherst, do not pay taxes in Amherst, do not um, are not registered or or uh, their 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 actual residency uh, as a uh, is elsewhere is outside of Amherst. And in that regards, unless those folks move back here to Amherst and do resume residency here or, or, or uh, establish residency here, then um, broadly speaking, we're saying that the, the reparations work, uh, reparations proposals would not particularly address those who, who live outside of Amherst. Again, there may be situations that could emerge where some flexibility in that regard might might be warranted, but um, but in general terms, the um, our, our local program we could recommend a a residency standard of being uh, uh, that that one reside in Amherst. Secondly, then is this question of the lineage standard, and this has to do with um, whether a person is able to trace their lineage. Um, over time to uh, someone who was enslaved in the United States. Um, we do know that uh, from its very beginning, even before the U.S. Constitution, going back into the times of British colon the, the British colonies, no, oh, the only group that was subjected to enslavement other than indigenous people whose rights were taken and who were effectively, you could consider them either slaves or POWs, but they, they had no rights um, within, within the society. Other than indigenous people, the only other people have been people of African descent. No European groups, no Europeans, no one from England, no Europeans were um, held as shadow slaves. By that I mean persons owned 
for life and indeed their children following the condition of the mother uh, owned for, for their lives by another person. It's only people of African descent who was subjected in the United States of America to that form of slavery. Okay, and it evolved over time. It, dis it did not exist when the first Africans stepped off in, in, in uh, Virginia. Um, there, this wasn't elaborated then in 1619, quiet as it's kept. This wasn't, this, pro this, this type of enslavement was not elaborated in the 1620s when the first ones come here through, through into the uh, Massachusetts uh, 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 colony. So the, uh, it, it's by the 1660s, 1670s that colonial uh, governments began to, uh, to write in law these kinds of criterion that allowed people to be owned, Black people, people of African descent to be owned. So we're the only group. So if you trace to an enslaved ancestor, then almost by, um, uh, it, 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 it stands that one is also tracing one's racial identity as well, as we have established this idea of, of, of races such as uh, Black or uh, of African, uh, um, uh, Black African descent. So <clears throat> the lineage, standard is one that um, I recommend we can uh, acknowledge it as a, um, as, as, a, as a criterion to be looked at. I, would, I am not particularly proposing it as a definitive criterion that the only persons or the only proposals that could come through our, um, through, through future uh, our, our reparations plan, our municipal rest reparations plan, only be limited to those who have an ancestor that was enslaved in the United States. But I certainly feel we should acknowledge that and acknowledge it in the sense of uh, what we have talked about, these circles within a wider circles. So at the very um, uh, center of our concern, the first circle, if we if we wish, would be those who uh, can trace their ancestry to someone who was enslaved in the United States, and even more specifically, who was enslaved in uh, the area of the United States known as Amherst, Massachusetts. Whether back to 1759, when it officially broke off from Hadley, or even before that time, in the colonial period uh, of, uh, in the period which was part of Hadley or all the way on down to the uh, late 1700s, uh, early 1800s, by which time uh, slavery, this kind of uh, human, uh, the, the legal owning of human beings of African descent was finally struck down and the Massachusetts legislature and the Massachusetts government uh, struck that down and you could no longer do that. So from that time period of the 1600s or certainly by the time Amherst uh, is, is, its, is its own municipality in 1759 on down to let us say 1800, um, uh, then in that period, if one was um, can trace to someone who lived in Amherst and was enslaved in Amherst, that would be a kind of first circle of concern, a first circle. Broadening out from that would be, of course, someone who can trace ancestry to someone enslaved, not necessarily in Amherst, but elsewhere in the United States. So that would, for example, take uh, myself into, into account and take others on this committee into account who, while, um, who can trace ancestry back to someone enslaved, but not necessarily in Massachusetts, not necessarily in, uh, in Amherst. And then even widening out from there in terms of uh, specific injustices that, we're, that we're, we're concerned with would be those who are uh, Black, who are Af African and uh, have experienced racism in Amherst without 
necessarily having ancestry that uh, enslaved ancestry in the United States. Um, so that then is at the widest level of concern. And I give you, for example, if um, the within the the program of uh, that that would continue from here, there was a young person who um, was, uh, or there were young people uh, in our high school wanting to go on the trip to Senegal or to Gambia and to learn about their roots. Although they, uh, but they, their ancestry might have been outside of, of Amherst or their ancestry may have been outside of the United States that was enslaved. So let's say, yeah, they descended from enslaved Africans, but say in Cuba or in, in Trinidad, and they are uh, unable to afford to take the trip. But if they could get a scholarship through the Reparative Justice uh, Trust Fund or whatever it's, it's to be called, wouldn't that be a, uh, um, uh, that could be deemed a very beneficial use of those funds to support through a scholarship someone who um, has this ancestry, is trying to learn, is trying to connect and understand their African roots. But again, they don't have African, an enslaved ancestor who was enslaved in Massachusetts or in the United States. So that's just by way of example, that if you look at it within these circles of, of, of concern and empathy, then we could still encompass those uh, um, coming from that background um, that, that may not have been in, in Amherst or even in the United States. But we could have those priorities. We could prioritize those concentric circles accordingly. Finally, there is the identity standard. And this has come up in um, reparations uh, theorizing and, and writing uh, analyses of, of reparations that um, the need for the person to be uh, to identify and to have been officially in some way identified as Black. Um, and we have discussed it in this group uh, in terms of, you know, one of our own members whose uh, birth certificate does not reflect their being Black, but they have a Black mother. They have, they, uh, they have lived a Black experience. Um, they are connected to the Black experience through their mother. But by virtue of official government records or what have you, and by virtue of, of their outward presentation, if you just saw them in a room, they would not necessarily be identified by others as Black. But nonetheless, they are. Nonetheless, they identify in that way. And so are they to be eliminated uh, by, by uh, a certain identity standard? I ask that we not adopt such an identity standard. There are persons for whom, if you see them, they're clearly Black. But there are others who, again, may have a Black parent, but are not so identifiable. But if they identify, then I think that there, could, there, there, there is a basis for, for eligibility there. So I open, those are my general comments and I open us for, for further discussion on those and, and possibility of a motion down the line, if necessary. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, so at this point, the, the floor is open um, and this could be in response to what Dr. Shabazz has just presented or um, could be outside of that. Um, in but sticking here with the allocation plan and eligibility criteria. And I'm going to go over to Dr. Rhodes. Uh, that was a good outline, Dr. Chavez. But uh, going back to the allocation plan, an allocation means that we're going to be distributing funds. And therefore, we need to determine how the funds are going to be di uh, distributed, uh, who is going to be distributing those funds because we go out of business in a month, when those funds are going to be distributed, and how, how often those funds are going to be distributed, and to whom. 
you know, and to whom is the part that, you know, Dr. Chavez just went through, went through in terms of identifying who that is. But I think the first task for us is to look at the allocation and allocation plan in terms of how we plan to distribute these funds and get rid of that. Uh, and once we've dealt with that, then go down to when the funds are going to be distributed. And then from there, uh, how often? And then to whom? Did anybody write those down? Those, he just laid it out really, really well. I did. I'm sure Mattia did. <laughs> Maybe <Okay. others. laughs> So, do you do you want to start with the first one, the the how, and and if so, do you have a recommendation or? I really don't have a recommendation, uh, but uh, I, I believe that the how uh, is that uh, relates to um, the mechanical part of this. You know, you have funds. Now, how are you going to be dis distributing? Is it is uh, are you are you going to have some process where you uh, write out uh, some sort of warrant to the uh, town council for the distribution of these funds? I mean, th those are mechanical kinds of processes to get the funds. It's sort of like you know you, when when you when you when you are uh, in the, this kind of situation where we are. A part of town government, uh, you have to have a way of asking for those funds, uh, and so I think that's that's a but that's that is really uh, not as important. It's important, but it's not as important as the other ones because that is a mechanical thing. It's a uh, a, a process procedural thing that we can determine uh, and 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 at, at will almost. And and and, and I'll, I I do have some suggestions for that. Uh, the, and, and the, the, then the second thing is, when do we wish to start distributing these funds? All right, do, you know, and that, we need to answer those, we have, these two, when and how often, we need to answer that uh, be, uh, in our report. That has to be part of our report. Okay, so, Dr. Rhodes, I'm going to go over to Yvonne because I see Yvonne's hands up, but I do want to say I like the style that we're uh, try, trying to work with in here, which is, I mean, hands up does help, but also having just free dialogue because we're in retreat style is also really important. Um, so uh, please, Yvonne. Um, the document that um, Dr. Shabazz, I appreciate it. It was really wonderful. Um, thank you for um going through that um the first i don't know where that document lives i don't know if that's your personal document um or that's something that we should have maybe have a copy of from the committee but i think that all I, you know I, first of all i want to say there seems to be a discrepancy um between section one and section two so in section one um there's the talk about residency and that um folks need to live in amherst to be eligible but also we've had many conversations about what the definition of harm is for African-Americans who have lived in Amherst, um, for young people who have gone through the Amherst school system, many of whom have left Amherst because of the harm they've experienced in Amherst. So I think that if we're looking to have residency as a, a criteria, then there should be a more formal way for folks who have moved away from Amherst to be also be eligible, um, and we should come back to that. I know it. I know that there's folks who will see the residency requirement and um, object, and I think and I think that we should address that before that the 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 latter happens. Um, there's a quote in the second section that says lived experience in town as black or African American. I do agree with that, but again, that's a discrepancy with the first section that says you must live in Amherst be a resident of Amherst in order to be eligible. Um, so there's plenty of people who have that lived experience may have lived here for 20 years and moved away. So I, I, don't, I don't understand why those folks are not eligible and, they, and I think they should be eligible. Um, and I do agree with um, Dr. Rhodes that, um, and with um, Dr. Shabazz that we should have very specific 
um, um, items in this report. Like, I don't think that there should be a lot of broad umbrella conversation. I think things should be as specific as we can get to. And so, yes, who makes the decisions about um, who, who, you know, is there another body? Is there another committee that are we taking applications from people? You know, like what is the procedure around the disbursement of the funds? And then even more importantly, I know we've talked about this, but I, maybe it lives somewhere is where the money's coming from. Like what pots of money do we take claim of right away? And, and say that the, you know, we're entitled, this committee or this reparations is entitled. I know some of the talk was around um, cannabis money. I don't know if there's others, um, other pots of money, but I feel like we could begin as well by talking about where the money's coming from as well. Oh, Yvonne, thank you. Before I go to Dr. Rhodes, I just wanna clarify two things um, that might be helpful. Um, I do believe that to receive reparation benefits, uh, one will have to, they, they will have, have to move back and establish residency again in Amherst. So it can be somebody that has been gone for however many years, but in order to claim benefits, they would have to, I believe, be living in in the municipality in which the benefits are being offered. But that is an open question that I'm making a list of questions for um, for council so that we can um, get a legal opinion on those things. Okay. Um, and then the other uh, piece that I actually know, you know what, I'll, I'll come back to that. Dr. Rhodes, please. Uh, I need to get something clear in my mind so I can participate in this meeting in some formal formal fashion. Uh, are we uh, looking for some outcomes here that relate to uh, first the two areas uh, of the allocation plan uh, and then in terms of uh, eligibility? Uh, do we wish to have at the end of this meeting uh, made some decisions in, in at least those two areas? That would be my hope, Dr. Rhodes, and that's why we started with this, because I think it's the biggest chunk of our discussion. Um, if we don't get to the other items, I'm confident we'll be able to get to them in our meetings that are coming up. But I would like to for us to walk uh, out of here and have some outcomes established. Um, so it, 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 for me, and, and forgive me if I'm, I'm being formal about this, because I think this we need to be careful of our time. And at the end of the meeting, have some products that we have, uh, have decided on. So I would like for us to focus on the allocation plan. And, and the first of that would be uh, is the how. But I can set, set aside how, because I'll come back to that. That's a formalistic thing. But uh, it's the when and, 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 and how often and to whom, and the actually the other, the only one before that, who is going to be distributing these funds? This assessed to our organization, which we need to define. So those areas are really important for us to concretize before the end of this meeting uh, so we can move forward. So I, I will just say that based on what I have observed from town government, um, we may want to create a mechanism, a system, a, a, a process by which um, uh, particular initiatives are brought, brought forward to a body. Um, so I'll just, for example, say if there was a body uh, that was recommended by this group, um, that body, similar to uh, the body that looks at the block funds that come into the town or that looks at the CPA funds, would accept proposals. This is one way that this could look. They would accept proposals from residents, from other committees um, for use of the funds. And then that committee would vet the various proposals that came in and determine how the money would be allocated. 
Um, another way to do it is more what Evanston did, which was to identify, uh, have that stakeholder body itself be the identifying body. So that body said, we believe housing is the first place that we want to look because of the redlining. So there, are, that's two different ways of doing it. Do we want this to be community? Uh, the community brings initiatives forward to a body that then vets those initiatives, or do we want that body to determine based on the harms that it knows uh, have occurred in the community, uh, how the which um, particular repairs to address and in, in what timeline. Um, so I think we need to consider which one of those or some combination of both. Um, and then the other piece I want to make clear just in terms of where the money lives um, so that that so that we have that in our mind is the money lives in uh, a stabilization fund that is specific for reparations and it will be growing uh, year by year. And so one of the things that we need to consider is whether we're looking at that fund as more of an endowment where the principal is going to remain and stay as it grows. And each year, because this gets to one of Dr. Rhodes's questions about when, each year, uh, whatever the, um, the sort of um, rate is that an endowment would allow you to skim off. Um, that amount will be used in the very early years. We're talking like, you know, less than $10,000 available to make a benefit. Um, so we have to think about, do we want to build this fund up and wait to start allocating funds until it's been built up to some point? Or do we want to skim off that bit each year and, and have a particular initiative that is 10,000, you know, the cost is 10,000 or um, so I want I want to be clear that there's not two million dollars sitting in a, a bank account right now. This is growing over time. And if we want it to be more like an endowment to sustain it over a longer period of time, um, then we have to put that into our report and make that wish um, very clear in the report. You know, uh, Michelle, I think that uh, it doesn't have to be either or it should be both. OK. And, and, and uh, whatever it is, whoever our successor group is, can take applications, and they also can suggest. So, so it shouldn't be either. I mean that that then uh, you know, uh, makes it a really strong point, and that's something we don't you know we don't have to debate that. It be, it goes right into our recommendation in terms of this committee. Uh, and and the second thing is that in terms of what you well. In terms of what you you said, usually in, a, in an endowment fund, an endowment will have X amount of money, and uh, it is set up where uh, the uh, uh, it is stated uh, within the endowment documents that a uh, certain percentage of the principal amount, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, amount of interest that has been been earned. That a certain percentage of that will be distributed on a year-to-year -year basis, and and the reason for that is if let's say we, you have a a, a million dollars, and it and it earned five percent, so it's fifty thousand dollars. What percentage of that fifty thousand dollars do you wish to distribute? Now, some really conservatively managed funds will say you shouldn't distribute any more than five percent of that. All right. Those who, on the other hand, say, "All right, you got 50, you earned fifty thousand dollars. Why not return twenty five thousand dollars of that uh, and have that continue to grow and take the twenty five thousand and distribute it? Therefore, you're you're, you're distributing fifty percent of the amount that has been earned. Uh, so, but you know, those and and in an endowment fund, those are the principles that." allow the endowment to A, grow, and to be there over time, while at the same time providing benefits for those who it's, it's designed for. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So if we think about, um, you know, 
if we're thinking about moving this in the direction of a successor committee, what we want to provide to that successor committee by way of our recommendations is a very clear charge. That charge tells the successor committee that it can take applications from residents and maybe there is a window of time in which those are taken and then vetted and then approved or not. And that it also as a body can make its own recommendations based on a certain criteria. Um, and then we need to tell that successor committee in the charge how the endowment is to be, which is the exactly what Dr. Rhodes is just talking about. So how is this fund uh, meant to be managed? And so if we, I think, and, 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 and then more specifically, the charge has to address the eligibility criteria, and it may be different. It may be different for different initiatives. Um, it may have more weight uh, for the small, the circle that is the focus in the in the middle that Dr. Shabazz was talking about. And then, as you know, the, as we brought in, um, perhaps you know, there's a different, there's a formula there. So I think that if we can think about that, that if we are all in agreement that a successor committee with a charge that gives this very specific information to within the charge to the successor committee, and that includes also composition of the committee. Um, I think that will formulate a, a, a good uh, structure for us. Dr. Lewis, please. So, um, so I would like us to settle on uh, one part of this, at least, and that is well, two parts of it. First is that, hey, this the successor group or whatever the successor community uh, committee is, who will be in charge of distribution of funds will uh, will be able to do it under you know two sets of circumstances that we have already you outlined. That's, so we need to make sure that that's 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 one part of we 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 decided on unless there is any dissent in terms of that. If there's no dissent, then we we decided on. The second thing that I would rec like to recommend it in terms of the fund in terms of how it's managed and how funds are just how and when funds are, or when funds are distributed, is that we go on the uh, uh, the library, Jones Library, uh, in terms of how their endowment uh, operates, which is similar to how all other endowments run. And it's a model that we can use uh, and the town would understand it and everyone in the town would, would understand it, we're, that, 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 we're, that we're gonna use and uh, mimic that model of how the Jones Library Endowment Fund is administered. So we don't, you know, in other words, we won't have to go and reinvent something, it's already there. So I will jump in at this point, um, trying to uh, get a little more specific about this how question. So we're hearing now two, and almost three different ideas. One that was first brought up, uh, brought up here today by um, Michelle, but we actually even talked about it. I brought it up way back when we first organized. And that's looking at the Community Preservation Act model. Um, second model now is the Jones Library, which operates, which has its own board of trustees and has its own endowment funds. Um, and then thirdly, with the word Irv used warrant, it conjures the old model of town meeting select board. Let's take each of those three and look at what those possibilities might be for the black community, the African heritage community in Amherst to in a way have a stake in this these funds and, and how they're decided upon. In the CPA model, and I ask people to rescue me if I'm wrong, but this is a specific board that oversees proposals that comes through. It has a designated stream of funds that are collected in taxes and, and a certain percentage that goes every year into a CPA Community Preservation Act pot. 
I think it may even get certain matching allocations from the state. And there is a, uh, a town committee that administer those funds. And here's the one I'm asking for folks to confirm. Is that group elected? Are they on the ballot periodically? And that membership we're looking at elected uh, mm -hmm. as well as appointed. I see there's a planning board member. There's a, but is the at-large people, are they elected or, or are they appointed? They are appointed, I believe, by the yeah, town yeah, manager. They are, yeah, they're all appointed. So this is a total, all right. So now let's jump to the Jones Library model. Now that has a board of trustees that is elected. It's elected on the town ballot periodically. And so the people of the town get to go and vote those members on. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. And, and and there's also a separate part of that. There is a, and, and that, and I, I'm, I'm, try, I'm struggling to remember, but there is a second part of that in which the endowment fund is separately administered uh, with the uh, collaboration of the trustees. And I'm, I gotta go back and look at that, but that's how I think it is. The friend, are you talking about the friends of Jones? Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. it's a, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Because there's that endowment fund came through uh, years and years and years ago, and it is separate yes. from the elected official. Sure. No, I got that. And then, um, but the but the regulatory body over that are those trustees we saw, right? Yes. But then the friends can be a separate 501c3 or whatever that raises funds that they then in turn give to the Jones to the Jones Library that's then approved for, by the trustees how it's okay. used. Right. Is that fair I, to say? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, again, I'm I, I'm I'm you know, I'm just I don't have it all on my mind. But yep. There are two groups that are that that are that are a part of that Jones Library. The, One the, of them the, is elected and the other group or uh, uh, God knows how they how they get there. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but go through that. Someone just brought all that up. But you go through that. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, and and I, I don't, I'm 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 wanting to know where you're going with this, Jabez. So uh, so I'm reviewing I'm reviewing these three these the I want to review these three different models to see if our thinking might pull out of it a best practice a, a, a best idea for us to go. The third one is. When you raise the idea of a warrant, the way I think about that is how might the black community of Amherst come together and and vet warrants that are then turned in to the town via whatever the, the, the then successor body might be? Is there a mechanism by which the general community, black community, could do it? And so I've toyed in my mind, could we create? a black town meeting, so to speak. And this black town meeting would meet a couple of times a year, people wanting to debate different proposals before this black town meeting would, uh, would submit those in the form of warrants that people attending the black town meeting could, uh, uh, could, could read beforehand, but then they get there, there would be a moderator who would regulate the debate and then folks could look at all of those different warrants and vote and make their recommendations. And when I think of the black town meeting, I'm not talking necessarily about town meeting members that get elected uh, by districts. I'm talking about more like the Pelham or more like the direct model that anybody black could show up at this black town meeting. They live here in Amherst, they, and they can then vote right there in that meeting in the discussion of the various warrants. And then that, those, those uh, uh, things they would vote from their periodic meeting would then go to the council or to the, to the successor body that we're talking about to then uh, uh, send on to the council. And that, and that successor body could be kind of like a select board. They would stay, they would 
meet year round to keep attention on the things that came through the warrants and, and, and refine them or whatever to send them through various committees, planning board, CPA, whatnot. They would be the body to interact with that on the ongoing basis through the year. And at the town meeting, uh, the, they could elect those, those select boards, so to speak, or successor body members. So three different ideas. I'm, I'm just outlining them just by virtue of, because it's, it's come up in our discussion, but I think it's for us to then think what would work best as the mechanism whereby the stakeholder community of black folks in Amherst could have their wishes be heard and translated into specific projects, proposals that, that then the successor body we're talking about would, would continue to work on and move through the council and, and whatnot for, for funding. I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good, that's a good, it's a good idea. That's, that's a, I think it's right on. I, I mean, I think, I think having those two particular bodies, you have one that's a, you know, a general community from the black community who come together on a periodic basis and say, here are some things we would like to bring forward in terms of how, uh, in terms of using these, uh, these funds for. That then would go to an actual body that has been, you know, um, uh, appointed by the town manager, who then takes those, looks at them, and then sends it on to the town council for a vote. That that works. Uh, I think that works really well, and it and it's streamlined, and it um, and it really would engender uh, community support in the black community in terms of in terms of participation. In, in terms of the other part of your and CPA funds, CPA funds are you know come from not only the uh, the state and federal government uh, on an annual basis, and then they're distributed through the CPA. Uh, our funds, however, are already there, and and they get added to early every year via a formula that has already been determined. Uh, so those funds are there. Uh, it's it, it's it's the uh, the, the thing, I, 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 what I want to put to bed is that process you outlined, Chavez, I think is a good one, and, and that we ought to go with that. Uh, what I want to, I like, we, like, like you just put that to bed. And the other one is that I would like to put to bed is, uh, uh, is all right, we got these funds. What portion of those funds are we going to expend on a yearly basis, and what model are we going to use? Are we going to be use the endowment model model that uh, the Jones Library goes by, which I would suge suggest because it is the model that everyone understands and and the town already is involved in it and it knows it, you know. So people understand it. We don't we don't have to invent. I have to explain that people know that. So I'm suggesting that we use that model. Okay, great. So I'm going to go to Yvonne and then I'm going to go to Ms. Bridges. Um, isn't there already a Black um, assembly that's been meeting pretty regularly? Um, so I do think that that, I mean, some of, I don't know how, we're, we're only in session as a committee until the end of this month, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah well, <laughs> until our report is completed and um, and presented to the town council. So, so I think if, you know, this idea, which I think as well as a good one of, of this black town meeting, I feel like it's going to be really important to collaborate with the black assembly to make that be something that is actually really um, um, accepted, you know, and, and usable. Um, I also wanted to um, ask a question about I mean, maybe I'm the one who doesn't know, but what what the specifics are of the Jones Library model? Because I do agree with um, Dr. Rhodes that if there's something that's already in place that's easy to um, communicate and to adopt, that 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 takes <laughs> that makes it our job a little bit easier. We don't have to like be creating something from scratch. And then um, before this meeting is over, I want to revisit the requirements for the residents. 
because I do think that there's a way for us to include a clause where we discussed how non-residents might be eligible if they, and I know that there's probably a legal aspect to that, but I do think honestly that a lot of the conversations that we had about harm um, excludes having a residency requirement like that excludes a whole number of people who would or could still be living in Amherst who chose not to live here anymore. You know, if they've lived here for 10 years, if they can prove their residency within a certain amount of time, they should be able to be eligible. And I don't think we should exclude those people. And I think there's many, I think there are many. I, I have a feeling you're right. And that's top of the list here in terms of uh, legal questions um, for the town attorney, because I think that would be really, really important for us to get an answer to and to know um, what flexibility we do have. Maybe there are particular criteria that we would have to follow for somebody who's out of state, but we can- Exactly. I just don't think that that's impossible. I actually think it's pretty easy for somebody- you know, someone who's gone through the school system from preschool to high school and graduated and went to UMass and then moved somewhere. You know what I mean? There are so many people who fit that criteria and can prove it. So I just well, you're talking about that. people who would who who moved who went to school here and et cetera, then moved away and then came back, but who are now current residents. No, no, I'm talking about people who went through the whole school system, went to school here, and let's say they even moved to Northampton and they don't live here anymore, you know, or they yeah, moved well, to New yeah, York. That, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Just, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that will be dead on arrival because our, we're dealing with, you know, Amherst funds and, they're, and saying this is going to be for Amherst residents. Uh, that, that wouldn't go anywhere. Well, let's let's uh, let's ask the question because there right. might yeah. I I I think that your instincts are right, Dr. Rhodes. That the council would probably be um, it, would oppose that, um, as would the town. But there there's a really good case for why, and so mm -hmm. we need to really think about. Um, I mean, it, there are, we know the housing issues that exist here now, we know the affordability, we know uh, the sense of belonging, there are so many reasons we could go on and on that people would move out of this community. Um, so I think we need to ask the question and try to see um, and be creative um, in the way that we approach it. I agree. I think we need to be the ones who say that this is important. And if the town says we don't support that, which you might be right, Dr. Rhodes, I'm sure that someone's going to say that's not going to fly. But that's not because we didn't bring it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, assume exactly. to, yeah. to, to bring it up, I would oppose it because it, it's, it doesn't fit. <laughs> if you don't live here, you're using taxpayer money, et cetera, and, you're, and we're going to, you know, you, and there are too many needs for people who are already here. I agree, but there can be there can be levels of the of of how these funds get distributed. Do you know what I'm saying? You can and and it I've seen it many times. It's not all or nothing. There are there are levels, and I think that we will get a lot of criticism if we don't at least address it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I I want to address it, uh, uh, even though I would oppose it, but you know because. You know that which is addressed, you cannot be accused of not addressing or thinking about, and just dismiss it out of hand. Mm -hmm. you know, I also, I, I also it. disagree and think that it's valid. I do think oh, it's valid. I know. Yeah, I'm I think there's so many people who would still be living in this town except that they had such a horrible experience from mm -hmm. high school. Right. <laughs> you know, and, honestly. And I hate to jump in, but since other people are, I wanted to co-sign with you, Yvonne. A, absolutely on that and maybe even it is some exit interviews like why are you no longer in Amherst the affordability the hostility so yes from a taxpayer maybe it's dead on arrival but let's have these conversations who have we driven away how many brilliant minds and artists and contributors to our community and what could we look like if we hadn't so I like the tiered approach thinking about it expanding in what it means and just at least having the conversations with some so yeah sorry to jump in I just wanted to Say I agree a hundred percent with you, Yvonne. And um, there's more to say about that, but I'm going to let us keep going because we got a lot to go. With this. Thank yeah. you. 
Yes. And I'm going to go to Ms. Bridges um, before you, I get, get to you, Dr. Shabazz, but I just Irv, want you to just keep in mind that if there was an out-of-town resident who could receive um, a down payment for a house in Amherst, so someone they've, they've left Amherst because they couldn't afford it, they've identified a condo or a home or land in Amherst that they could receive down payment for. That's a perfect example of where it would make complete sense um, to provide a reparation benefit to someone that's not a current resident. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that, yeah, you're talking about a person who is committed to move back to Amherst. One if possibility. Fact, if, if it's a possibility, if they're gonna, they're gonna move back, if they're able to achieve housing. Yeah. But okay. they, they wouldn't be eligible with the criteria the way it is now because they wouldn't be a resident. Exactly. Right. So there Absolutely. has to be something, right. There has to be something, some kind of way to address that. That's the bridge and we can, yeah, we'll come back to that. Um, all right, Ms. Bridges, I saw that you had your hand up a couple times. Can you hear us? But this, this is just going in and out and I, I've been like leaving back like at least 10 times um, myself. I, um, I have to lean on the side of Irv because I, I had harm. I was born and raised here. I had harm from 10 years old. I think Ms. Bridges is reconnecting now. Okay, here I'm back. Can okay. you hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. I had I was I was just saying I had harm, as you know, my little story from fourth grade with the teacher. And I had harm from, you know, every once in a while up until I moved away when I was 40 and I was gone for over 20 years. I am back now, but if I don't think if I didn't come back that I would feel that I was being gone over 20 years. I don't feel like I would be eligible and I would feel like I would be um, knocking somebody else out, so to speak. Why would you feel that way? Um, because if I was gone for like over 20 years and I'm fine and I'm not here, I would feel that somebody who's stayed here and has been here and has keep going through this, that they would be more, they would, I would feel like they would be more, more eligible than me. But that um, kind of invalidates your, me. doesn't that invalidate your experience though? It doesn't invalidate it. It's still there, like anybody all over the country. <laughs> it's not going to invalidate. It's not going to do that. I'm. I still have it in my heart. I know it happened, but I would just kind of feel like, you know, pushing somebody aside that's been here, that stayed here. I left. I didn't leave because of that. I didn't leave because I was having problems. I left because I wanted to leave because mm -hmm. I thought it would be better for my my daughter mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I had another a better opportunity mm -hmm. but I, that's just how I feel I mean it's just you know mm -hmm. and another thing I'm, I would be concerned about all right once this is done, over who actually allocates this money to people I don't think we should do that I um And you might have missed that part of the discussion, Ms. Bridges. Um, so we were talking about another body um, that would be, it would have certain, um, like a charge where the composition of the body would be very clear to the town manager. And he would set up like he does with any other town committee, uh, an interview um, body that would take applications for the committee. And, and so that body would be the one allocating and really would be the keeper in many ways of the fund. Because another thing you want to remember is at any time, any year, any council can decide that they are not going to contribute the 200 or whatever thousand dollars it is at, 
in that year. And that there is nothing that uh, enshrines it into, you know, there's no bylaw. I'm sorry. I'm bad. I just. Oh, I was just saying. Sorry to interrupt. Just, no, no. I was just, I was just following up on um, that. There will need to be that body um, that is appointed by the town manager with particular criteria in terms of the composition so that he's very clear. And that body is going to have to make sure that not only are they, if we go with this um, black town hall or town meeting, which I absolutely love, um, if we go with that model, that body is going to have to also deal with making sure that there's somebody who is getting into the council on a yearly basis or the finance committee to ensure that that money is going to get transferred. So that that body will have a pretty a, a hefty charge, um, but it will be the keeper of all of that. Oh, OK. Does that. I mean, that's what we're proposing, at least, is and yeah, and yeah. I'm sorry because I just my this this it just keeps going in and out, and I keep having to get leave it, or it kicks me out, and I got to keep coming back in. So I might be missing a few things. So um, forgive me if I'm um, going over something you already talked about. No, no worries at all. It's, so yeah, um, I uh, guess. Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, one of the things that I mentioned was also the Jones Library um, model for their endowment. So what are the specific things that we can adopt that would be beneficial for us if we, you, you know, utilize that model? I was just trying to look that up, Yvonne, and I um, haven't gotten to it yet, but I will, that's a great question. And if Dr. Rhodes is suggesting that we don't reinvent the wheel or that perhaps we take what they have used and make some modifications that are specific for us, we may not need to at all. Um, Dr. Rhodes, do you have- yeah, oh, just, the, uh, we, we can get that from the Jones Library, but the Jones Library is a model uh, uh, that is used throughout the country. You know, and and throughout, and also it's also a model that's used for individual uh, funds portfolios. Uh, it's a it's it's a standard model. It's not like something that's, you know, it's right there and 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 it's embedded in the uh, endowment uh, uh, documents of the Jones Library, and it's very easy for us to get a hold of that. But there's a difference in that Jones is a public 501c whatever it is, and the successor body we're talking about appointed by the town manager that would receive proposals from the black community it is not a 501c3 so what i'm saying is maybe there's some ways in which what i heard you as raising as the endowment model is simply to say that the existing stabilization fund that is earmarked for reparations okay that we are not talking about spending that the decision we're trying to reach consensus on is that we're not talking about rec rec recommending an allocation plan that calls for spending out the two million dollar commitment over the next two years <laughs> you know over the next five years we're going to spend out whatever comes into that stabilization fund that instead here's the the extent of where the model exists we're saying we want that money locked up, continues whether in the stabilization fund or whether it needs to migrate to a separately administered, that part I'm not, I'm fuzzy on. I don't know if Herb or Michelle or something, if you're talking about migrating it out of a the, the town stabilization fund. Is that what is going on here? No, I, it, it, I, I just thought about it. it uh, the town, the town has all kinds of funds that are unexpended, all right? Uh, those funds go into an account. That account then earns interest. Exactly. All right. Now, what I am talking about in terms of the endowment model is, all right, if, it, if, if the town is holding that money and it's gaining, and it's, uh, you know, gaining interest, what if any part of the interest do we want to spend expend on a yearly basis, all right? 
and 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 when I say the Jones model or whatever, what what the what, what decision is made that says, well, we're not going to expend, you know, we're not going to spend all of that that the interest that is accrued. We're going to uh, spend some of that, and and those are decisions that then that has to be made either before by us right now but certainly by uh, the uh, body that uh, uh, secedes us. That's an important decision. But let's get clear where we are maybe approaching some consensus. So if so, we're saying, and, and this kind of requires putting on the finance committee hat, um, we're saying let's continue to build through the free cash model we've been on that has us up to Maybe somebody's got the right number, 400 and something thousand. Yep. And keep that going to till it, as has already been agreed upon by the council, to where it gets up to 2 million. And then when it gets up to 2 million, are we talking about separately administering that in its own endowment fund, or does it just continue to be invested? by the town and with the understanding that at some point we can start drawing the specific interest. I, I, that's all I'm trying to get. Are we gonna have that ultimately be administered like the Jones Library as a, as a specific endowment, you know, that, that may still be handled by the same investment company, but, but is a separate entity once it reaches 2 million? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that uh, that uh, that those questions, uh, in my mind, have already been answer, been answered, and that that they're going to be administered by the town. The town's going to do what it it has been doing in terms. I think of you're right. Funds. I think you're right. You know, uh, uh, there are other funds that are like that, like this particular uh, uh, funds that I, the name escapes me in terms of those funds. That are there, and they and they are then handled by the town. Here, those funds would then be put in the hands of, in terms of expenditures, by this other group. That I got you. The group, they then will decide upon, uh, you know, how much of that they want to expend. But from our point of view, from my point of view, it would be. I would like to say that our, the charge that comes to us is that the town administers those funds the way that they uh, they do for enterprise funds that they, that they administer right now. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, a determination is made that um, how are you going to uh, expand or spend the interest portion of the funds? Or are you going, you know, the interest portion of the funds? And how much of that interest portion of the funds are you going to uh, you going to uh, expand on a yearly basis? Those are questions. So let, me, that, so let me make a bold suggestion: the town already has two million, more than two million, that is is an investment money. Why can't it go ahead and just say we've got reparations has two million now? You dig what I'm saying? And we don't have to continue waiting on this little game for 10 years before it reaches 2 million and we've then got the interest amount. Why don't we get them to go ahead and approve that there is a $2 million established uh, account for reparations and that the interest of that you can begin spending in 2024. Boom. Very good idea. I, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would, I, would, uh, I got, I got to think about that for a moment because you could say that because money is continuously coming into the uh, the uh, stabilization fund for reparations. All right, you know it. You know that that's going to continue coming in. You you could you could project that hey. Two million is already there. Here's the annual interest rate in which it's going it's going to accrue. Why not distribute whatever portion of that that the 
successor groups thinks is prudent to expand at that point in time. Because then the win becomes 2024, possibly, rather than 2010, I mean 2030. Because right now it's on the boat that we're not getting any interest until 20, I mean, from this, this, this uh, a theoretical fund, we wouldn't be eligible to draw any interest and start spending for reparations till 2030. All right, so here's, but, here's uh, a- uh, here's Dr. Here. Rhodes, I, I just wanna ask you to pause one second. Jennifer had her hand raised and I just wanna make sure there's not an, a, a, an issue that she needs us to deal with. Jennifer? Uh, no, I just, had um, some questions, but I'll continue, please. Okay. Here's what I would like to do. I mean, and uh, I got, why am I saying this? Where's my time? Anyway, um, I, I would um, I would like to sit, sit down with Sean mm -hmm. and uh, get a financial model together to do exactly what Emil Carr is talking about. Now, having said that, this horror goes off in my mind. When the hell am I going to get the time to do this? But anyway, it uh, it needs to be done. Uh, yeah. and, and, and Sean is the person to do it. And it, it's not like an hour's meeting. It's, it's probably like a, a, a 30 to 45 minute meeting because the models are already there and the calculations are already there. And he puts it into the computer and says, here's what it, where, where it is. Anyway, I, I will. I will agree to do that. But don't it, it, it'll be important can, for the can conclusion. Can we clarify? Of hold on. If could, could we just clarify what Dr. Rhodes is proposing doing? Because I think that the council has made itself clear that they want the flexibility on an annual ba basis to decide whether they have the funds to take from the certified free cash and move. Yes, so are we now asking, are we making a different ask? Because no, that no, no, is no, not no. going to be a 30 minute conversation with Sean. No. I can tell you that it's right not, now. We're not making, we're not making. <laughs> if that were true. We are not making, we are not making a different ask. We are not, we're not going anywhere above and beyond that, what's already there. For instance, an assumption can be made that uh, 150,000 is going to be distributed into this account every year for the next eight years. An assumption could be made, all right? That if you then assume that at the end of 10 years, there's going to be $2 million in there, mm -hmm. right? If you say there's $2 million in there and you're going to expend X percent of that, let's say 5% of the interest, the interest it, it, the $2 million earned interest of 5%, which is $100,000. You can then say, all right, what percentage of that do we wish to expend of the $100,000? I'd say I'd say 100, but you've raised the thought, the, the thought experiment of 50,000. Okay, yeah. so, so, so go. Yeah. So, I mean, because you want, you want, yeah. So you say $50,000, all right? Okay. You want to spend $50,000. So, so Sean, we have X number of dollars in this account right now. We know it's going to grow to $2 million. If we take out $50,000 now and using the discounted cash flow model, you can then uh, determine what that's going to look like in terms of impact on your fund over a period of time. It is those calculations are done. In fact, yes, uh, it's a brilliant idea, Dr. Shabazz. In fact, that fifty thousand dollars could be expended. And so, Michelle, we're trying to ask: Can we get fifty k in twenty twenty four for our successor okay. group? I have this little calculator here, and I'm just wondering, just to, so we can do an exercise real quick. Is this so? Would this? What would we input into this to try to under? So you're basically saying is we're pre we're taking the interest prior that that we're assuming the 2 million and taking the interest on that 2 million in year one, as opposed yes. to waiting until, okay. I think I understand. Yes. yes. Um, and, and that, that might be, I would say it would probably be about an 
uh, at least an hour, an hour and a half <laughs> conversation with Sean and some other stuff. But, but that's that that's an inter that's interesting. And and you're suggesting just to be clear that this gets done not separate from the report recommendations that this body deals with that. Is that what you're, that we deal with it now? Like you go in and have your meeting next week and talk to Sean and see if, if, yeah, if that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then I think that uh, it should be a report, part of the report. I think it will have to be approved by the yeah. council. Yeah, that's, the yeah. council can approve of that. The council say, all right, all right guys, you want to take up $50,000 this year? Uh, we will then, uh, through the calculations that Sean has done, be able to debit that over time. That would have impact on, on, on what would be happening ten years hence, and the impact ten years hence would be minuscule. Got it. Well, two things I just wanted to throw out there in case um, they're relevant here is there are and have already been requests from private individuals who want to contribute. So we need to think about what we're going to put in terms of recommendations um, for how the successor body will handle private funds or uh, contributions. Somebody could leave their whole house to the fund. They could, there are a lot of different possibilities and we need to have clarity on how we want that um, to be handled by the committee. The other thing is we, we do need to make a decision about special legislation and whether we are going to uh, want to pursue that based on giving direct ben benefits. Um, and so I think my feeling is talking, seeing if Paul will allow us to have 30 minutes with the town attorney or whatever amount of time he will allow us to have to revisit the special legislation and to understand um, what of our recommendations actually would require special legislation. Like, is a direct payment for a down payment on a house considered, is that considered where special legislation would be needed? Um, and then also to address how we might deal with private funds um, as well as out of town residents and, and how that will be looked at. So I know that's a little outside of the scope of the allocation plan conversation, but those are things that were on my list to make sure that we start to think about. Um, I'm going to call a five minute recess so that if folks have to use the bathroom, because uh, I do. Um, so let's return actually even four minutes at 535 and, and we'll have about a half an hour left. Um, so recess until 535.
If, if you're back, if you can just turn on your camera to let me know you're here. Just if you could turn your, I know you can't turn your camera on, Ms. Bridges. Are you back? Okay, I see Bon. Paula, are you back? Well, while they check in, if I can ask Yvonne. Yes? Of course, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dr. Ms. Yvonne, I'd be prepared to amend the residency lang the language on the residency standard to include the possibility of, um, of projects or initiatives that uh, <clears throat> might address um, uh, persons with lived experience in Amherst who, are, who currently do not reside in Amherst as well, uh, whether or not the benefit ultimately mandates that they return or be in Amherst or not. I hear your point on that, and I'm prepared to, to revise the language I'm recommending on that. And I'll say this for this reason, two things, one, I used to live in Tulsa. I lived two years in Tulsa. And I know that from the racial, the race massacre of 1921, where people were actually had to leave Tulsa in fear of their lives and were unable to return to Tulsa because of fear of their lives. Um, there was particularly someone that I've written about, um, uh, uh, Andrew Smitherman, who was a newspaper editor, had a black newspaper a uh, weekly newspaper in Tulsa and the, the racists there did not like him. They did not like um, his truth telling about what was going on in Tulsa. And so he left and moved to New York uh, State. His, his business was burned out. He suffered great, great harm. And it just was not safe for him to return. But if there had been a reparations uh, proposal in Tulsa, it would have been objectively, it would have been completely warranted that they imburse uh, Mr. Smitherman for, his, for the harm and the damages he suffered, regardless of whether he would return to Tulsa. He, he absolutely would have been entitled, in my view, to, to reparative uh, justice, to, to reparations benefits. Of course, reparations has never, yet occurred in Tulsa in terms of any kind of cash benefits. They have built a community center. It's called the Greenwood Community Center. They have done a number of things to try to memorialize. And, but in terms of direct benefits to any of the survivors, it, it remains a, a shame on, on Tulsa, that Oklahoma, that that has not occurred. So, but, uh, so anyway, flowing from that idea, if there was, as you point out, a, uh, as you say, a very objective case of someone who experienced real harms in Amherst and felt unsafe to live here and have felt unsafe to return, but a real case could be made of their deserving um, uh, a benefit, even perhaps a cash benefit, a thousand, five thousand, twenty thousand. I don't know what it could be. The whole little amount we're talking about here for one year, the whole fifty. If it was serious enough that any objective mind, any of us with empathetic heart, could read it, could hear the story, and say, you know what? Yes, and 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 further that the rest of the town could could understand that. Then I say yes. We should not preclude that simply on the basis of you know, we want to keep the money in Amherst. We want to keep any money given out to somebody in Amherst. So I, I, I could uh, definitely revise well, and to I, at least allow that possibility. Right. I, I, I appreciate it and agree. Just the, you know, the people I'm thinking of are students that um, were involved specifically with some of the work we were doing that at U UMass with New World Theater. And I, I can tell you how many young people from the group that we used to call 2050 were harassed to the point of living of not living in Amherst, always leaving the town. And 
And I just don't think that, and I'm sure, I mean, that's just one small example I have in my mind, the, the, the young people I spoke with that were like, I'll never step foot there. I can't live there. Um, you know, I'm being targeted. Like I can't drive my car without being stopped. I can't walk the street without something happening. I'm going to move away you know, and not just, you know what I'm saying? So I don't think, I I, and I think there are many, many other people who have that experience. I'm sure um, Hala and others here might know of people who have said that to, you know, specifically. So I don't think that it's fair for us to let the town off the hook for that kind of experience. You know? 100%, Rachel. Okay, uh, Dr. Rhodes, you're muted, Dr. Rhodes. Oh, where I'm coming from is, yeah, there is one one person that I know who no longer lives in Amherst that definitely should be compensated for. Dr. Driver. True, true. 100%. All right. 100%. No longer yep. lives here, lives over in Hadley and uh, a place there. There's no, no doubt about it that something should be some amount of money. All right. And I, I agree with that. But I don't agree for other people who were here and then left and they're no longer here uh, that then they should be compensated in some way unless they were moving back into Amherst and needed homeowner assistance or something like that. But if they were not going to be moving back into Amherst, then I would oppose that. And because that's a cash payment, that's something we're not even empowered to do anyway. So uh, there you go. Let's keep the door open. I, I hear right. you. Let's just I say keep we the should open. keep the door open. I agree. That's what I think. We heard you. We heard you. Heard. Doors, doors open. I'm just. You, you, made a, you made a brilliant example. You just gave us a brilliant example. Yeah, right. That's, you know, that is something that I would uh, stand in the middle of the town hall and say, we got the money. Let's give it to him. And that also, I want us to think about how that actually also speaks to the university's role potentially, and um, the in, or any institution that would be involved in a situation like that. Yes, uh, <laughs> see, Doctor Shabazz, um, because Dr. with my employer uh, now, Amherst now. College, Amherst College as well. I mean, I mean, my sister went to Amherst College. You know, I know many of you know stories of things that you know occurred there, and so. Yeah, yeah, I think that that this is this is important work, and it goes a lot deeper than than I think that this little committee can take care of by the end of June. You know what I mean? But but because we're writing this report, I think those things need to be reflected in the report as I something agree. that as something that maybe the next group that takes this on can take on with some I clarity. Agree. Yeah. Yep. And just to be to be clear, in case someone's listening to this, um, Professor Driver was a professor at the University of Massachusetts. Um, the Associated Press put out um, a report on his experience of being um, paid, un, basically paid differently than his white peers, um, and so uh, that is a particular example in which. Uh, it's you'd have to determine who was culpable for the full harm there, whether it was the town or the university or some combination. Um, but remember, Michelle, other kinds of harms as well, even of what not able to find a house, housing, here, to yeah. go outside of Amherst to be able to find a house, uh, you know, other ways he, he and his family were targeted uh, on and off campus here in Amherst. Absolutely. That's a great example of where both the town and the institution were. I mean, yeah, that, that, he should, that should be exhibit A yep. of our moral responsibility for taking account of and being responsible for that, which this town perpetrated on an individual and their family. And that is something that I would see as being front and center of our report in terms of reparations. 100%. And, and, and that when we say, hey, you know, 
we, we don't do individual reparations, all right? That here is a crystal clear example yeah. of where we should be doing reparations and we should be actually be doing reparations in conjunction yeah. with the university. Yeah. And then the, the, the other, other exhibit B is the house that Amherst College was supposed to uh, deal with and they, deal, they dealt with it in a dishonorable manner. Exactly. Dishonorable manner. Hundred percent. See, Amherst College, I believe, would take responsibility for that if we pointed that out in our report and then presented to them the evidence that this occurred, and yep. that they need they need to take steps to, to repair. Fix, to repair. So for full transparency's sake, I will share that I met with President Elliott at Amherst College about uh, the Coleman family and um, their property there. And um, I am, that's for another discussion because um, I would like to be able to speak with you about that um, with more articulation and with some other additional information. Um, but President Elliott was very open to um, taking the information that I provided and also open to following up to continue the discussion for how that can be researched and repaired. I also met with TC and his sister at their home and, um, and, and had, was able to have a discussion with them about, um, about that. So I think what I'm hearing, and then I'm going to go to Ms. Bridges, is that our report will, may and will, I think, also include some very narrowly tailored recommendations, some very specific recommendations about specific cases. Um, and I think Matia and I um, have already discussed that actually at, at some length. So um, I'm going to go uh, to Ms. Bridges now. Ms. Bridges? I had my hand up, but this thing is not working. <laughs> it just keeps kicking me out, coming back, kicking me out. So I missed <laughs> a, a few of it. Um, but I wanted to just let Yvonne know it would be nice to, to, to have a conversation with her. Um, and Michelle, you look frozen, so I don't know if you hear me. We hear you. I hear okay. you. <laughs> okay, you're frozen. I don't know what's wrong with this, but I'm gonna. Uh oh, we lost you, Ms. Bridges. She's lost. While we wait to see if Ms. Bridges comes back, um, Jennifer. So I just wanted to check in about like the timeline of reparations it, is that is sorry. it is she back in okay go ahead i'm back in i'm sorry it just keeps telling me i just wanted to you know when you have time to really think um i just you know it would be nice to have a conversation with yvonne and just think about you know what happened how far away how far back it was and you know what I was thinking about, but it would be nice to really um, talk to Yvonne more and hear what she has to say more about it. Sure, I can do that. Not now, because we need have our time for this. No, not now. Not now. Yeah, yeah. But I, <laughs> but yeah, there are there are examples. You know, so. Um... Sure. Sure. Okay. Is... Okay, darling. <laughs> um, okay. Good. Okay, Jennifer. Um, I guess I just don't fully understand like the length of time that reparations will occur. Like, is it ongoing or is it like a short term or like, I'm just trying to figure that piece out or understand that piece. And because it makes a big difference. And I think to some degree how things are distributed. And then also I cannot stress enough um, about trying to find other ways of funding like I still think that that solar proposal that we had a while ago um, and maybe the project not be the solar itself but that was a great example of the way that the town could help rip some of the harm that's been done to the black community by setting them up with their own like business but letting them be separate right like 
similar to the way that that solar um, proposal was. And then um, also, so when it comes to individual payouts to an individual, if that's the way that the group goes, I don't understand why wouldn't we just con couldn't we just contract with someone as opposed to going through special legislation? Isn't that what Evanston did? Um, no. Um, they, well, they did in the sense that they uh, right. So they went through a mortgage company um, to uh, to allocate the down payment money. Yeah. For a bank, um, there was quite a bit of opposition to that um that doesn't mean it wasn't the right decision but there no. was you know there was opposition to that um but i think you're making an excellent point and i think given and if everybody has a chance to re-review the legal opinion that we got way back that was one of the um the options and that's where i think jennifer having um lauren visit with us again now that we're at this stage would be really, really helpful. Lauren is um, the KP law attorney that we've worked with previously. And um, I, mm -hmm. but, and I, I just think that my only other concern about the possibly taking out the money in 2024 instead of waiting till 2030, which I completely understand. Um, but what, as Michelle said earlier, the council, it, it's not, I mean, we. it's good hopes that they will give us that money each year, but there's the possibility that some years we don't get it. And then how does that impact it? So I have a solution for that that I'm going to present, but let's go to Dr. Rhodes. Are you, Jennifer, do you still, are you still going? Um, or I want you and Dr. Rhodes to have a back. Well, I guess, and, and then back to the the length, because as long as harm is done, then there should be reparations. And so then how do we continue that throughout, I, you know, whatever amount of time? I'm, I'm always concerned about the funding piece. I've been concerned about the funding piece from the very beginning, so. Um, I think I have a solution um, that in my town council role, I might be able to, that I'd like to present, um, but let's go to Dr. Rhodes first. And you know, you know, we have all, all endowments, and this is no different. Uh, the assumption is that money will be con continue to be contributed on an annual basis, all right? And that annual and the contributions will be somewhat uniform. <laughs> now, sometimes it won't be. Some years it will be more, and some years it will be less. In relationship to how our money comes to us, some years it may be less, and some years it may be more. Now, that unequal cash flow distribution is, is a challenge in terms of calculation. But everyone who deals with money on any kind of long-term basis has to make certain assumptions. We do that as a town every year, year after year, in terms of making assumptions in terms of how money's going to come in, when it's going to come in, and how we're going to expend it, and at what time frame we're going to expend it. We make those assumptions. Those, are, those assumptions are standard kinds of assumptions. Otherwise, if we didn't make those assumptions, we would not be able to operate. So the same kind of assumptions will be made in relationship to expenditures of the money that we, were, we will be suggesting. We will make those assumptions. Sean will make those assumptions. And then you live or die by those assumptions. All right, so uh, that is not a fear for me because I, you know, Sean's a smart dude and, and I know that when we sit down and go over this, we can, we can deal with it. And Jennifer, to your to your, your to your question is, uh, yes, we have we have agreed with the town in terms of the money that comes into our account. That has been agreed on. The method is agreed on. All right. The only thing that don't we don't know is how much each year will be put in there. But we have agreed on where it's coming from. We know what that funding stream is. All right, and that is known, and it's an agreement that has been made. All right, uh, 
So the only other thing is, hey, should we add to that? Should we identify other sources of funds? That's for this committee to identify and then to go back to the town council and says, hey, why not here? You know, I, I think you know, in terms of my mind, if I were going to do it, I'd say, hey, look, let's every year the CPA gets a portion of money allocated to it. Why not say, hey, CPA, you're getting this money allocated to you on a yearly basis, CPA, you will agree that you're going to allocate X percentage of that back to the reparation fund. That could be done. And there are other parts of that that can be done also. But all I'm saying is that everything that we're talking about is doable. Everything that I've said in relationship to this fund is doable and can be done. Uh, you know, the financial models are known. You know, I'm not talking about pie in the sky here. This is stuff that has been around for hundreds of years financially. So anyway, I'm 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 really fairly confident confident of that. I would like us when we before we sign off uh, in terms of our report that we at least attempt to identify additional sources of funding. And and to your point, Jennifer, I look to and I expect other um, members of AHRA to be coming forward with specific ideas or specific proposals. We've already identified a couple of them brilliantly here today with respect to the Coleman family, the driver family. I think there's also the solar uh, uh, black ownership uh, idea. Um, I think definitely we ought to have, uh, I'm projecting right now in my head, at least 10 um, kind of specific sort of you know ideas and, and i just say that off the top of my head because of numerous other things that i've heard from you know from our various listening sessions that that are that are completely in the scope so i think there are some of these specific ones but then we want to keep the door open in terms of for the successor group to be able to initiate or you know receive uh other ideas down down the line Okay, so I just um it's 557 and um we are not going to get to the other two items that we need to discuss today. I'm going to make some suggestions for that, but quickly I just want to share that what we have with the town right now is a handshake. And to turn that handshake into something uh that is more reliable, we need a policy. And so what I'm suggesting that we do is that we draft a policy. Uh, we, I can work with different people that um, can be helpful in that. Um, and that we recommend this policy in our report be adopted by the council. If there is a policy just like any other, the housing policy, the financial policy, um, then we've turned it from a handshake into something that the town clearly, no matter which council is there, no matter which people are there, will be able to follow very clearly. Um, so I would like to suggest that as part of our recommendations. I would also like to, to suggest thinking about um, another way to approach the CPA piece of things is to recommend that um, we pursue some sort of uh, percentage that the CPA must allocate toward whether it be black led initiatives or BIPOC led initiatives. The CPA is uh, something that its criteria come from the state. So that might be where a recommendation actually has to go through a special legislation process that then says in Amherst, X percentage of CPA dollars need to be allocated specifically on an annual basis to projects that are that come in from black residents. Okay. So those are those are the two pieces that like on the like kind of legislative side of things I can I'll take on those pieces and trying to get some draft uh, language together that 
um, we can include in into I, I would I think that having a policy before we uh, are finished in terms of that two million is is really important. Um, so that uh, question then, and I'm going to go, Dr. Rhodes. I see your hand is up. I'm wondering if this time next Sunday to do this all over again, <laughs> but with a different set of topics. Um, I do see Ms. Bridges left, I think. Um, she did, and and Miss uh, Pamela and I have the basketball tournament slash Youth Hero Awards next Sunday. Thank you for that reminder. What time is that, Jennifer? Uh, from like 10 to 5. 10 to 5, okay. How do... Because I think that this is, I think we need one more of these um, or, you know, we, tomorrow, in, who, I think Yvonne is not able to join us uh, tomorrow's Could meeting. I do the, could, oh. I can't tomorrow either. You can't, but, Dr. But on, no, on the, no before leaving the Sunday idea, um, could I provide the Zoom link and the recording and then send the recording on to the town to be archived? Does it have to be from the the town's uh, uh, Zoom Zoom account. I mean, if a balance of us can meet without our liaisons, I think we should still try to meet. We can. Someone could open. Someone else could open for us at request. I I believe, um, and then that that person would just hand over host to me, and we would make sure it got recorded. So. Okay. But we may want to be at that event at least. I was going to say that seems like a good opportunity for the AHRA members to interact with some of the Amherst residents that might be there. What 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 event is this? Is this? This is the the Jennifer. Will you talk about it? We have uh, it's the old versus young basketball group. And the Human Rights Youth Hero Awards and Race Amity Day is all in one event. Oh yes, one event on Sunday, and so oh, yeah. I just because a lot of the folks from Old versus Young are a uh, Black American, a uh, Black Amherst residents, I would think that it would be important. Or were former Black Amherst residents, I think it would be important for you guys to someone from the AHR to represent there. What what if we meet? Um, what if we we try to get somebody who can uh, open for us, but we meet from five to seven on Sunday next week? I'm sure that we can just open for you. That's fine. At yeah, five. I'll, I'll, I'll try to go to some of that in the earlier period. Um, I think I know somebody who's cooking for that, and, and they make and they do good grilling. So I, I should at least go and get a little taste <laughs> of the food. It, it, is it is it possible, Jennifer, if you could forward all of that location data and time back to me? I'd appreciate it. Sure. And I think it's at Mill River, right, on Sunday from ten to five. Yes. Okay. So who can, if can can, Hala, can you meet next Sunday from five to seven? Yes. Okay, what about you, Dr. Rhodes? Uh, are you willing to write a letter to my wife explaining why I'm not going to be present for certain things? I'll take then her to will, lunch. I will, <laughs> then I will answer it in the affirmative. If you're not able to write such a letter. I am able <laughs> and willing. <laughs> yes, please. Because I think if we, so Dr. Shabazz and Yvonne, is that a time that would work for you next Sunday? I need to make note. it work. I, I need a note too. Okay. <laughs> I, I can get you a note, definitely. I think that if my, we, my husband's like this waiting outside the door right now. Like, right now, I'm gonna I, be done. <laughs> I have to go to I my capacity is definitely yeah, been reached. Um, but I I think that we will cancel tomorrow's meeting. Okay. So um I will take that time to hopefully meet with Mattia to go over what we've um she's been here the entire meeting with us. So um, and, and, and then we'll meet next Sunday from five to seven. And I think if we have that meeting, we can get everything all like all, most of what we need for this report completed. Um, 
So folks, we covered a lot of good ground today. I really think this is really good. good. I think so too. I think the report will reflect, really reflect what we believe, you know, and yeah. be a really yeah. great starting point for the next yeah. the next iteration. I do. Yeah. 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 You know, and one final thing with respect to that solar piece and in general, uh, and I hope to kind of provoke maybe for next meeting, is this whole idea of land, you know, and the, some town owned land being dedicated to, 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 to Black Amherst uh, in some form of fashion. Some of it could be in a solar array, some of it could be in terms of uh, hallowed ground, sacred ground, but um, at any rate, thank y'all. This has been okay. a good one. Thank you. I this agree is with really that. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, um, if there aren't any other comments or questions, we did not need a public comment period today. I am going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 6.05 PM. Yay. So everyone have a wonderful week and thanks to Mattia as well in the audience. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you.